So good afternoon and welcome to today's conversation on Domingo Morel's timely and important new book, Takeover, Race, Education, and American Democracy. I'm Susan Moffat. I'm the director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy. Welcome to our panelists and welcome all. It's great to see a full house here tonight. The Taubman Center is focusing on three themes this year, the cost of living, the value of democracy, and the price of security. And Domingo's book really nicely speaks to the intersection of these themes in his look at the effects of takeover on political empowerment. He writes, and I quote, the systematic political disempowerment of black communities through the state takeover of local districts shows how education has been central to the project of state-sanctioned political inequality. But Professor Morell's scholarship also opens new terrain by examining and explaining both empowerment and disempowerment and offers some conditions when takeovers can empower black and Latino communities. So I'm delighted that we'll have a chance to unpack his work and the mechanisms that play in our conversation tonight. And I'm really pleased to celebrate the accomplishments of my colleague. Domingo, we miss you. It's great to have you back. Please come more often. So moderating tonight's event will be Professor Marion Orr. He is the Frederick Lippitt Professor of Public Policy and a professor of political science and urban studies here at Brown University. He is the author of, an editor of seven books, and a specialist in urban politics, race and ethnic politics, and African American politics. Thank you, Marian, for moderating tonight. So our time together is going to unfold in the following way. Um, professor Orr will begin by introducing our panelists here. Um, professor Domingo Morel, Professor Vashla Weaver, Professor Michael Jones Correa, and Professor Jeff Hennig. And then Domingo will offer some opening comments about his book. Then each of the panelists will offer some summary comments. Professor Orr will offer some questions and um, offer some questions to the panel, then we'll open it up for, for conversation. Since we are a full house tonight, I'm going to move myself to the overflow room. Um, our South Common Room. I will be conveying questions from the, uh, our overflow room down to the conversation here so, so all questions can be attended to in our conversation. And then I hope everyone will join us um, for the reception afterwards in the lobby of the, of the Watson Institute. Now, will you please join me in very warmly welcoming Professors Domingo Morel, Professors Veshel Weaver, Professors Michael Jones Correa, Professor Jeffrey Hennig, and Professor Orr. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, everyone. So good to see all of you. I'm just so happy. Uh, to be a part of this uh, very special panel on uh, this important book entitled Takeover. I'm delighted in part because I remember when this book was a seminar paper. <laughs> and Domingo was in my urban politics seminar when he wrote a paper in my course on Central Falls and the fact that Central Falls had been taken over by the state of Rhode Island. Do you remember that, Don? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember some of the conversations we had about his views about Central Falls. I wrote a book on Baltimore uh, and Baltimore had been taken over by the state of Maryland. And I recall our conversation, what he said to me was, he said, you know what? He said, when the state came over, uh, came and took over the Central Falls schools, it 
open up opportunities for the Latino community in Central Falls, opportunities that had been blocked by the existing structure. And I said, wow, that's interesting because when, in my book, I write very clearly that the black community felt violated. The majority of the community there in that community felt violated when the state of Maryland came in and took over. Here, you see, I had a young graduate student who was thinking this through and who was perceptive enough to understand that in some instances, takeovers may indeed empower some and disempower others. And as I recall, Domingo, your, your dissertation had a title something like disempowering. So I'm just delighted. You can see why I'm delighted. This is the kind of the experience a, a professor loves to have, to see a, a student takes his idea. Okay, it wasn't my idea. His idea. Flesh it out. Develop it with some modicum of, of direction, but, 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 but to flesh it out in a full kind of way. And, and the, result, to re the result tonight is, is this book entitled Takeover, Race, Education, and American Democracy. I'm also delighted that we have pulled together a distinguished panel of scholars who, who I believe are able to take a look at Domingo's book from multiple dimensions. And so these great scholars were not just randomly uh, selected. I'm going to introduce them and say a bit about why I think they're going to come at this from, from their particular expertise. I'm going to start on the end here. My far left is Professor Henning. Jeffrey Henning is a professor of political science and education at Teachers College and professor of political science at Columbia. Jeff is the author of many books on urban education politics, including one I co-authored with him that won a major, uh, major book award. So Jeff has a real deep understanding of the politics of education. You know, we like to think that politics, or rather education, for me, that you should not involve education politics together. You know that? Because this should be a matter of just teaching the kids, and that should be it. But Jeff and others have, have been able to help us to understand that, that there's just real politics in public schooling. And so he's going to help us in, in this panel, I believe, uh, help bring to light the politics behind some of what Domingo has fleshed out in his, uh, in his book. Jeff is going to go first, and he's going to be followed by uh, Michael Jones Carrere. Michael is a professor of political science at University of Pennsylvania. He's taught at, Har at Harvard, recently at Cornell. Distinguished scholar on Latino uh, politics. Okay. It's part of a group of scholars in I believe 2006, who put together this huge survey of Latinos across the country, perhaps the best survey of the views of the politics of Latinos in this country. So, so uh, Professor Michael Jones Carrere, you see, is going to help us understand the dynamics of the racial and ethnic politics when we think about state takeover. And then, sitting next to uh, Domingo is, is Vesla Weaver, uh, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Political Science Sociology at Johns Hopkins University in, in Baltimore. Uh, professor Weaver is broadly interested in understanding 
racial inequality in the U.S. And, and, and especially for this particular panel, especially the role that the state, that the state plays in, in, in inequality. She has a wonderful book uh, called uh, 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 Front Lash, uh, subtitled Civil Rights, the Carceral State and the Transformation of American Politics, which covers the connection between the movement of civil rights and the development of punitive criminal justice system. Okay? So we have here a dynamic uh, and wonderful panel, and uh, they're going to be able to, I think, Domingo, help, uh, help us flesh out uh, the many interesting points and perspectives and questions that your, uh, that your book, Takeover, raised. So I'm, again, let me say just how happy I am, again, to uh, participate with all of you in this panel. And then let me call on my distinguished colleague, Professor Morrell, now uh, to uh, take off and begin this panel. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marion uh, and Susan. Uh, before I get started to talk a little bit about the book, I just want to give a special thanks to, to Marion. He was my advisor, but what he didn't mention was not only was he ma my advisor and um, I took several classes with Marion, but if it wasn't for Marion Orr, I wouldn't be, I would have never been a student at Brown University because it was Marion who uh, saw me doing community work and in a similar uh, panel like this, and he had known that I was interested in going back to school. He reached out to me and he said, apply, apply. And I don't know what type of uh, negotiations happened behind the scenes, <laughs> what type of lobbying happened behind the scenes, but it's something that I know I'm cons it's consistent with what I know of just through experience and through research, that if you have a champion behind you, uh, that opens up doors. And so cer certainly Marion has been that. Uh, Susan Moffitt, who's also part of my advisory, uh, uh, part of my uh, dissertation committee and advisor, has been just an example of, uh, a stellar example of what it is to be an advisor. So today we had an all-day conference with some of the best known uh, intellectuals in this country, and it was all because Susan, uh, once she became director of the Taubman Center, one of the first things that she did was she reached out to me and said, I want to organize a conference around your book. And I wanted to, I want to have an a all-day essential conference with some of the leading scholars in urban politics help me put this together. And so not only was she a great advisor uh, during my time as a student, but she's, here she is still as supportive as ever uh, as uh, an assistant professor. Uh, and then also other wonderful people at Brown University, so Ken Wong, who was my, also on my uh, dissertation committee, has been uh, a great advisor and colleague. Wendy Schiller, who's in the back, who's now the chair of, of the uh, political science department. She was also a great mentor while I was a student here at Brown. So my family knows, I don't know if anybody else knows, but when I came to Brown to study political science, my first political science was as a graduate, uh, my first class in political science was as a graduate student here. I had never taken political, I never studied political science. And so it was because of people like Wendy Schiller and others who really trained me to become, you know, transition from a community organizer type to a, to a political scientist. So I thank Wendy and everybody else here at Brown. Uh, of course, I thank my family members and so my mother who's here, uh, my wife Lisa, my two daughters, Natalia and Camila, who are really excited that they're famous now because their names are on this book, <laughs> and they're, <laughs> they tell their, their friends in school and their, and their uh, teachers that they're famous, and so I thank them. And, uh, and to the community, you know, friends and other friends and family who are here uh, who have always been supportive, and I thank you. Uh, this book is it's really a, a community uh, endeavor. And so this book, as Marion mentioned, it started off as me puzzling through what I thought was happening in Central Falls. As I mentioned, I was, I was involved in community politics here in Rhode Island. I had seen 
what happened in Central Falls. Central Falls was a city for us here in Rhode Island, Latino community here in Rhode Island, that was really hard to mobilize, really hard to organize. But by 2009, as when I was a student here at Brown, I noticed something started to change. And that the Latino community in Central Falls, Latinos representing the largest, uh, the majority of the population in Central Falls, they began to gain political power. And part of the reason why was because of the schools. Now, thanks to the work of Hennig, thanks to the work of Orr and others, we know how central schools are to political empowerment. And for marginalized communities, Latino communities, African American communities, and so forth, once you're able to get members of that particular group on the school board, then that opens up doors for the city council, the mayor, and so forth, uh, majority, and so forth. And that's indeed what's happened in Central Falls. So today, Central Falls has majority uh, Latino population, uh, Latino uh, uh, representation on the school board, city council, and have a Latino mayor. So that's not surprising. But what was surprising was that the first Latino members to serve on any level of government in the city of Central Falls happened after the state took over the schools in the 1990s. And as Marion mentioned, that's contrary to what we had known. So we didn't know a lot about takeovers in terms of any systematic studies of takeovers, but the case studies that we did uh, uh, know about, like Baltimore, Sarah Reckow, who she's not here right now, she's probably up. Oh, oh, yeah, you are. I'm sorry. Her, her and her colleagues did work in Oakland, and other colleagues did work in uh, Detroit and other places where they showed that communities really did not uh, uh, like this idea of, of a takeover because it meant a loss of local autonomy, a, a loss of democratic rights, voting rights, and things like that. But in Central Falls, it seemed to be something else was happening here. And so I developed these hypotheses, I won't go too much into detail, that communities are affected differently. If you have high levels of political empowerment, you are more likely to have the negative effects of a, of a takeover. And if you have low levels of political empowerment, it actually might open doors for you uh, to, to access uh, uh, a path to political empowerment that perhaps didn't exist before. And so I had to collect data because we didn't have any data set to be able to, to help me test th these hypotheses. And, you know, for graduate students who are here, you know, I think it's a very important thing for you to collect data. I don't know that it's a great, I, you know, I still, I probably have whatever little gray hairs I have is probably because of that, collecting, collecting data for a three-year period. But at the end of that process, what the findings showed was showed support for that hypothesis that high level uh, political empowerment communities who are mostly African American communities who experience the takeovers there seemed to be a decrease in descriptive representation on school boards after the takeover and for low level political empowerment communities like uh, mostly Latino communities that it seemed to have a positive effect on descriptive representation for this community and so that sort of supported where I, you know, the arguments that I was making. But at the same time that I'm doing that, there's other things that start to emerge, which lead me to question the focus of my research. And the first was, that as I was collecting this, the, the, this data, that it's not just a takeover that occurs, but it's a type of takeover. And so when states take over a local school district, they can employ essentially one of three different options. One option is that the state comes in and they leave the elected board, the elected school board in place. The second thing is that, second option is that they come in, take over, remove the elected school board, and replace another school board, an appointed school board, like what we saw happen in Central Falls. And then finally, that a state co co could come in, take over, and abolish the school board altogether, not replace it at all. And what we saw happen was here, um, here's the makeup of different type of, of takeovers according to um, majority white or majority Latino or majority black districts, that the takeover that results in the abolishing of a school board disproportionately affects African American communities. So if you see here, the majority black districts uh, after takeover, the elected board remains in place in only about 20% of cases. For whites, on the other hand, that's 70% of cases. And even uh, essentially the abolishing of a school board where a re uh, school board is not replaced at all, that's uniquely an African-American experience. So we know how school boards, what an important role they play in the foundation of political empowerment. And here is a case where African-Americans are having their school boards removed and there's not even an appointment process. There's nothing, right? So that, that led me to kind of, uh, question 
the, 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 I guess, the narrowness of my research. In addition to this, I also was doing case study work outside of Central Falls. And uh, it was in New Jersey, primarily a focus on Newark, but not only Newark. And the reason uh, I chose New Jersey for several reasons, uh, it was the first state in the country to, to take over a school district. Actually, it was the first state in the country to actually pass a law to take over school districts. Then it became the first state in the country to take over a school district. Um, and in addition, in, in addition to a number of things, uh, New Jersey was three hours away. My brother lived in New Jersey. I have a, <laughs> he, has, he, he, he has a couch that I was able to utilize. And at the time that I was doing that research, uh, uh, my wife and I were expecting our, our second daughter. So it was you know, convenient to be able to go in the morning, interview several people, attend a school board meeting at night, and come back. So New Jersey made sense for, for, for many reasons. But so one of the things that became clear to me while I was doing case study work, and primarily, again, in Newark, uh, was what I was observing. So here's a picture of, of, of a school board meeting in Newark. Now, if any of you are familiar with school board meetings, it generally doesn't look like this, right? <laughs> so that year when I was there, uh, the 2012-2013 school year, on average you had 300 people that attended school board meetings in Newark. Uh, and you know, I write, I write a, a lot about this, but I want to um, just uh, read briefly a passage from the, from the preface to show how my research project started to evolve, primarily because of uh, the other things that I just mentioned, but also uh, because of what I started to see in Newark, which had their schools taken over in 1995. As an outsider, I came to study Newark's experience with the state takeover of his local schools, armed with data and narratives that the existing scholarship had provided. The dominant narrative was, that Newark had failed to produce an adequate education for its children, and state authorities had to intervene in a district that had failed to meet this basic requirement. The central claim in that narrative, explicitly and implicitly, is that the community and its local officials were not responsible and capable stewards of their children's education. Indeed, the Newark schools have struggled. However, what I saw at the first school board meeting and for every other school board meeting after that and every meeting I attended at a coffee shop, church, community agency, or home, all revealed what seemed to be a counter-narrative about the role of the community and its local officials in the Newark schools. These observations led to further questioning. In, in addition to understanding the political implications of state takeovers, the reason for state takeovers also merited examination. The dominant narrative that states take over school districts because of a community's inability to educate their children had not been critically challenged by the existing research. Perhaps a takeover occurred not because people didn't care, but precisely because they cared and demanded more. By caring, Newarkers may have set off a series of political struggles that had significant political consequences. Can this thesis withstand the weight of social scientific inquiry if so, is the Newark experience an outlier or representative of a broader experience shared by other communities of color, particularly black communities? Or is Newark a harbinger for state local relations in the US? After all, Ken Gibson, Newark's first black mayor, once famously said, wherever American cities are going, Newark will get there first. These questions altered my research project and the search for the answers to these questions became the focus of this book. So it wasn't enough to study the implications of state takeovers, the reason for takeover. So why takeover? Is education and education concerns the driving force behind a takeover? And why are black communities not only disproportionately experiencing takeovers, but disproportionately experiencing the most punitive forms of state takeovers? I don't have time to summarize all of the findings, but what what my research, based on interviews, based on historical analysis, based on uh, data set analysis, all showed that takeovers are a result of a collision, a political collision that took place between African American communities and cities, demanding that they be recognized as full citizens, demanding that their schools be adequately funded, demanding that they have a say over education. So that aspect versus a uh, conservative force at the state level, which reshaped itself in the 1970s in response to the de these demands by African American communities that were made up of Republican governors, Republican-led state legislators, 
uh, policy, conservative policy organizations like the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Cato Institute, Heritage Foundation, which all emerged in the 1970s. So that collision between these two forces, that's what leads to takeovers. So it's political concerns, not simply education concerns. And so what I hope the book does then is um, lead to more questions about how education fits into this broader political conversation. Veshla Weaver and others have done a wonderful job of showing how mass incarceration has led to uh, the disenfranchisement of communities and how mass incarceration, the carceral state, is part of a project that seeks to mar marginalize or result in the marginalization of communities. And what I think that this book is able to show that the carceral state, that mass incarceration is not alone in that project, that education which too often we just think about sort of a benign or shield away from politics is central to that project as well. So I look forward to hearing what uh, my colleagues have to say. Uh, thanks again for everyone being here. And uh, thanks, Marion and, and Susan and Brown, for hosting this conversation. Thank you. <clears throat> So I don't know how many of you have this experience when you read the review of a new series on TV or going to be streaming on Netflix, and it has all the elements that you normally like. For me, that's you know a mystery set in some dark Scandinavian country <laughs> with a deeply flawed detective. Um, <laughs> That's roughly how I felt when I encountered Domingo's book um, and realized that it combined urban settings, political battles, race and ethnicity as key variables, and like a, a cherry on top, a major focus on Newark, which is where I happen to have been born. Uh, in a very obvious way, is this is a book about race and ethnicity and politics, and we need more of those, especially ones that walk the line, as I think this one does, between on the one hand making the case that race and ethnicity are critically important to understanding political dynamics in American cities, and on the other hand tipping so far as to present race and ethnicity as if they're the only issues that matter or ones that play out in neat, predictable ways. That said, I'm assuming that the race dimension is so important that others on the panel are going to talk about it, and that we'll talk about it generally, and that that's going to be talked about a lot in response to the book. So I want to use my time to turn attention to an, another thing that I think is important and touches on another thing I care about. And if you think I was weird to care about Scandinavian detective movies, you'll think this is even weirder, which is I care a lot about federalism as a political institution, as a governance institution. And that's what I want to talk about. You can leave now and come back. <laughs> <laughs> so let me say something about what, what I mean by federalism and the politics of federalism. I'm not talking about the formal division of authority between the national government and the 50 states. Those who study American government and politics began more than 50 years ago to move away from a vision of federalism as a layer cake. There's stuff that happens in Washington, D.C. There's stuff that happens in this state. Um, and substitute that with a vision of federalism as a marble cake with swirly, complicated, changing relationships, not only between the states and Washington, D.C., uh, but also between both of those layers and multiple sub-state governments, including regional bodies, uh, municipalities, school districts, and special districts of various sizes and structures. And this metaphor, this layer cake versus marble cake metaphor, has become part of the standard lexicon for talking about American federalism, and it's led to a much more nuanced and appropriate understanding about how domestic policy plays out. But I want to say there's an important dimension of federalism that has to do with the politics of federalism that hasn't received the attention it merits. Most uses of the marble cake 
metaphor start from the perspective of policy, particularly, particularly how responsibility for addressing and implementing different substantive policies is shared across levels of government, rather than being neatly parceled out either to the feds or the states or the locals. The traditional example is Medicaid, or one traditional example is Medicaid. You may think of it as a national program. In many ways, it is a national program. Congress enacted it and defined its, its uh, key parameters, and national taxes pay for most of the cost. But state participation is voluntary. States pay about 37% of the cost, and they have the options, which some do, to push some of that cost down to local level. And the law uh, and waivers that are available to states also give states the ability to make important decisions about eligibility and what's covered and now work requirements. Another quick example of policy federalism torn from today's headlines is immigration. So, so we think of the federal government as having responsibility for immigration and border control, and they do in most respects, but some localities have positioned themselves or been charged with positioning themselves as sanctuary cities um, uh, based on the degree to which and ways in which they, they cooperate with federal agents in enforcing some of the immigration laws. And you have some states that are siding with their localities and protecting them from, from or trying to protect them from retribution from the administ national administration, and others where the states are siding with the Trump administration and uh, themselves trying to punish the localities for engaging in these policies. So this is interesting and it's important, but what's missing from this traditional perspective on marble cake of domestic policy implementation is enough attention to politics, by which I mean the interplay among groups with distinct values and interests and with different amounts and forms of power to shape not just how policies are carried out, but also about the policies, the priorities that are select, selected and enacted, power over this formation of policy, not just how it's carried out. State takeovers from this perspective represent something much more than relying on the governor or the State Department of Education to make sure that commingled state and local dollars are spent well and wisely. Um, they also have to um, do with shifting the venue within which conflict and no negotiation takes place over what the values and priorities of public education ought to be. So in the case of the book takeover, that means the venue that matters is not the school district of North or Camden or Central Falls where local parents, local teachers, community-based actors, and local officials battle and talk, but instead institutions at the state level where groups and officials from rural areas, suburbs, other, other cities are pushing and tugging also for influence and for goodies that government distributes. This is not necessarily a shift away from democratic control, and Domingo points that out. Um, that the politics of federalism does not necessarily lead to this disempowerment of minority urban po populations. One way to think of this is the, the, uh, the politics of marble cake federalism creates a series of concentric uh, democratic venues for conflict and no negotiation. So individual school communities are nested inside of Districts, districts are nested inside of states, states are nested inside of the national government, with each venue hosting different combinations of groups and comprising different um, um, uh, um, majorities and empowering different majorities. That means that groups, and Domingo referenced this, advantaged in one arena can be disadvantaged in another and vice versa. Moreover, because the boundaries are permeable, political actors can shift among these. They can fight at the local level, fight at the state level, fight at the uh, at national level. Both issues and actors can shuttle from one to another, making the outcomes less predictable and less stable. So what does all this mean, especially from the standpoint of lower income and minority groups that have historically been more marginalized? Just a few 
claims I want to make, I think, consistent with the book. First, marble cake politics elevates the importance of what political scientists like to call venue shopping, interest group strategy of pushing decisions to the level of government where they have the best chance of winning. Second, venue shopping can at times provide a new opportunity for the disempowered. For groups that are traditionally disadvantaged in urban settings, it means that an alternative uh, to investing in direct competition with local elites uh, who uh, they haven't managed to unseat is to try to shift decisions to another arena, the national government, say, or the courts. So as happened in New Jersey, and Domingo talks about this in the book, uh, uh, um, when the state legislature was unwilling to address severe fiscal inequities across districts in school funding, uh, the state courts were uh, responsive and open to that. That's an example of venue shopping that, that empower uh, um, uh, African American largely and low income communities in, in New Jersey. Um, third point, that said, in general and over the long haul, I think marble cake politics creates a tough game board for lower income groups to play upon. Venue shopping calls for resources to monitor multiple venues, to pursue political advantage in more distant places. Um, a wider range of skills and resources are called for. So while low income or minority groups can sometimes gain advantage by venue shopping, the op that opportunity applies to their opponents as well, who are often better resourced. If they, their opponents, feel their advantage in local arenas is slipping away because of demographic change and changes in local political power, they can also opt to venue shop and probably do so, as I suggested, with more resources to draw upon. So, and this is where I'm leading to a, 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 a first a pessimistic and then a trying to leaven it with a more optimistic conclusion and then I'll stop. So does the fight need to fight a multi-front battle and the prospect that just when they are gaining control of the institutional levels, levers of power at the local level, the game may be shifted to another level, mean that the deck is even more stacked against low income and minority groups. And sadly, and in general, I think I have to say yes. Um, uh, but I don't think that the prospects are totally bleak. And this is, I do this all the time in my classes. You know, During the semester, my students get more and more depressed as I go on. And then, <laughs> then at the end of the semester, I try to say, well, but you know, he, this might happen. OK, so here's two reasons. This is where I'm going to finish on two more optimistic points. One is networks can make it possible for locally-based community organizations to strategically locate with those in other places. Uh, which may make it more feasible to fight uh, battles not just locally but at the statewide and nationally. For example, in a new book edited by Barbara Furman called The Fight for America Schools, uh, Julia Sass Rubin writes about Save Our Schools New Jersey, which is a group started in 2010, reportedly now with over 34,000 uh, supporters, and that links uh, um, parents and organizations in multiple New Jersey uh, uh, communities, some of them suburban. Um, uh, the largest numbers are in Newark and Trenton, but there are also members in more affluent communities like Cherry Hill, Princeton, and Montclair. And that group has the potential to battle at the state level as well, even if the individual groups in each of those cities might not have been able to. Second and last more optimistic point, is based on the observation that there does seem to be something of a trend moving from take over to give back. Uh, so in May 2016, Louisiana announced the beginning of uh, the shift of control of some important degrees of local control of schools that had been taken away and put in a state uh, uh, governance body of uh, the recovery school district began ha, have begun to move uh, some aspects of local control back to uh, New Orleans. Uh, in September, New Jersey announced plans to return control to Newark. Um, 
uh, something that it had earlier proposed for Jersey City, which it had taken over even earlier than Newark. And in December, uh, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf announced that his administration has approved the return of Philadelphia public schools uh, to local control. So I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's not clear yet how big a movement this is and what's uh, <coughs> causing it, and maybe we can talk about the implications uh, later because I'm eager to hear Domingo's views. But I'll just end by saying that one possibility is, uh, is that the politicians and interest groups that originally pushed for takeover may have come to the realization that the job of, of running cities and running urban schools is tougher than they thought, <laughs> and that they are either giving up or regrouping, if, if you're concerned, uh, uh, regrouping to pursue their interests through other means. But uh, the more optimistic interpretation is that at least some of those pushing for reforms and for the takeovers were motivated not just by the desire to control resources, which is part of the story in the book, but also a desire to improve schools and stabilize local political environments. And that the lessons some of them may have learned is that they need genuine partners at the local level and need to engage with them rather than blow past them. And if that's the case, then this might uh, uh, be a happier ending than I had suggested a few minutes ago. Thank you. Right. So I, I don't know. Um, well, I'll just have to talk. So. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be commenting on uh, Domingo's book, Takeover. Uh, you, uh, we so rarely have an opportunity uh, as scholars to celebrate each other's work. And uh, it's a, such a pleasure to be here uh, to celebrate uh, this wonderful uh, accomplishment. Um, and uh, you know, we all know that, particularly all of us who are parents, that schools are key battlegrounds, that uh, parents feel very deeply about their schools and their children's education. Uh, their kids are the most important part of their lives. These are they're the schools which shape their kids uh, are the central institutions, the central local institutions for many people. It's the one uh, local arena in which many people um, ever engage in. So they may not care about who's mayor, or they may not care about uh, who their state representative is or who their congress member is, but they sure as heck care um, what, uh, how their schools are run and uh, how their schools are doing. That's how you get 300 people showing up for school board meetings. Uh, so schools are key political battlegrounds. I think uh, Domingo's insight is that these battlegrounds are not just local battlegrounds, that there is an interaction between the local and the state. Uh, and state governments uh, are increasingly engaged in intervening in these local uh, school districts in a way that, that hadn't been the case before, that, they, that states had generally uh, avoided, um, but has now become more common. And it's, it's more common in part, as Domingo points out, uh, because these decisions are being driven uh, by uh, ideological <laughs> battles, uh, particularly by Republican legislatures, Republican governors who want to experiment uh, with educational reform. And I think it's a reflection of a broader split in our uh, politics in this country uh, between, as Jeff mentioned, uh, urban and rural areas. This is a long-standing uh, division in American politics, um, but uh, the, it's being reflected in this way around this particular set of uh, political decisions as Republican legislatures seek to um, intervene in local schools. So uh, there's a real issue here. The real issue is uh, the failure of uh, public education. 
uh, the failure of, edu of, of, of schools. And, uh, but the intervention is an intervention that targets um, local leadership, local school boards, local school governance, um, and is a, a kind of racial paternalism um, that, that states uh, and state legislatures somehow know best or know better. Um, and so by replacing school leadership and replacing the decision making, um, they make the school uh, leadership, school governance a scapegoat. Um, it's not at all the case that this replacement of uh, leadership addresses the deeper structural factors um, that um, have led to um, the failure of, of schooling um, and that taking over uh, these schools uh, doesn't address. Um, instead, so what does, uh, what do these takeovers accomplish? They're uh, ideologically driven, as I mentioned, um, and the way for um, particularly conservative, but not only conservative um, reformers to experiment with um, school choice, vouchers, charters, um, and it's unclear that any of these experiments actually work. Um, so in the end, for thinking about, you know, these are schools, there are, these are, there are children involved, what in the end uh, does this accomplish? Um, it's unclear. Um, Domingo addresses this question about uh, the, the opportunities or the, or, the, or the diminishment of opportunities that these takeovers uh, accomplish. So there are winners and losers. And on the one hand, as a result of this disruption, it can create an opportunity for new leadership, uh, particularly for people who uh, have been uh, out of power. And those can include, uh, in some cases, Latinos or in some cases, um, uh, uh, the views of those who, who haven't been fully represented might be immigrants, uh, uh, language minorities, um, but it is also disempowering. And this disempowering is very much a core theme of the book. Um, so uh, I just want to raise uh, a few questions and uh, lead to some discussion. Um, so uh, one is that there's, uh, just as there's a kind of irony in that uh, Republicans who talk about wanting to preserve um, local decision making and keep the federal government at bay, uh, there's an irony that um, in the course of wanting to protect um, local decision making and local political power, um, that there's a privileging of the local, which is, I think of as sort of, in some ways, a very conservative position, um, given the history of preserving the local um, as, a, as a racial tool. Um, so there's an irony, I think, on both sides. And I'd love to talk more about that. Um, the, uh, there is, uh, there's some questions here about uh, whether you think empowerment is zero sum. So if some people are, uh, are disempowered and it creates opportunities for the empowerment of others, um, is it, so is it always the case that that, that that disruption of power is a zero-sum disruption? Um, and I'd like to hear you say a bit more about that. In the book, you, uh, in this discussion about the tensions between state politics and local politics, uh, the book is really uh, privileging the perspective of the local um, so it, it's, it, there's this conflict, there's this tension. Um, but it's privileging the view uh, of the local. It, 
uh, it's the locals view of this conflict. Um, and one of the things I wondered about in reading this is um, what, whether you have a sense of what the, the state's perspective of this conflict would be. So I feel like there's, a, there's another side to this story and uh, I'd like to hear a bit more about that. And finally, um, uh, teachers are professionals, um, and they are often organized uh, as a, through unions. And the voice of teachers and, and the professional unions, I felt, got short shrift in, in this narrative. Um, I, don't, I didn't hear uh, what role they were playing. And I would have to think that their role was, would be a central role, particularly in a state like New Jersey. And uh, so I wondered if uh, we could talk a bit about that. Um, but this is all, I mean, these are, I'm, I'm raising these questions because this is an incredibly rich book and uh, you know, it's like any good uh, noirish uh, mystery. Uh, uh, you read it and you and you come away with it and you go, "Oh my gosh, I have like ten million ideas and things that I want to raise." Um, and so that's how I felt uh, coming away from this book. Good. So first, I I just want to begin with an anecdote that may seem like it makes little sense, but I'll show you the connection. I was uh, at a conversation with a, a very well-esteemed public policy scholar uh, who works on criminal justice issues, which I also work on. And we were having a heated debate, uh, it turned very heated, uh, uh, about uh, uh, crime and the responses to crime in black communities and brown communities versus in white communities. And I sort of prodded him and said, well, you know, we know based on lots of longitudinal uh, uh, evidence of youth moving through their life courses that uh, white communities commit crime at very similar rates and use drugs at very similar rates as black communities. And so why, how do you explain the divergent responses to uh, uh, to drug use and to, to uh, criminality and criminal offending. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, in white suburban middle class communities, we can trust the parents. <laughs> we can trust the parents to police and oversee their children. We, exactly. Uh, <laughs> we, we can give them autonomy because we know that they will regulate their kin. But in black communities, the parents are often single-headed, disordered, and he went on in, in this fashion. Why do I bring that up? Because Domingo's book is about that ideology, and I want to call it an ideology, maybe you don't call it an ideology, but I kept hearing that in the book. The ideology that race, class, subjugated communities are not fit to govern, are not fit to oversee their children, are not fit to educate, are not fit to informally, socially control their kids in the same ways that white communities are. And that courses through Domingo's book. It reminds us that the government is oriented differently, sees state projects of oversight and monitoring and regulation and management as core to the mission of governing race class subjugated communities. That's what Domingo Morell is doing in this book and that is what scholars of American politics have been slow to take up, have not noticed across a variety of different uh, uh, sites of governance of race class subjugated communities. The book is extraordinary in that regard. You're taking up something that we haven't, we either haven't noticed or we haven't identified 
But there's a separate logic to the governance of race, class, subjugated communities. It's the kind of book I love to read, not only because it's short and snappy, but I learned something on every single page. I learned how much I didn't know about local governance, about how much I didn't know about schools as political battlegrounds, how much I didn't know about the politics of Newark and, and, and Central Falls. You move very comfortably across different sources of data. You're using uh, uh, political narratives, policy disputes, newspapers, interviews. You constructed your own data set that now graduate students can go on and build off of. And you do it with clarity and insight and ease. So on the back of the book, you'll notice uh, that I have a little blurb, right, that says, and it seems like I didn't read the book because they only excerpted like like the part where I said, I'm going to give this book to every grad student that walks through my door. And I meant it, because it shows how in a discipline that has so often seeded incredibly important political questions to other fields, fields like sociology, in pursuit of the next fancy randomized experiment and next fancy, I'm sorry, I'm being harsh on my discipline right now, but this is my hobby preach, horse preach, of place. Preach, preach. <laughs> you say, you know what? This is what matters for my people. And I'm going to unearth that story. Surveys be damned. So I want to suggest that you're taking on questions at the heart of inequality, the heart of democracy at the heart of what it means to be a black person in a city governed by an external force. And I want to suggest to you that it's bigger than the sum of its parts. Um, don't just take the findings uh, of takeovers for school board representation as standing alone. They say something much, much bigger. And I'm going to riff on that for a little bit. Then I'm going to pose a couple of questions of where I think that the research actually has legs, where uh, you or graduate students, or I'm happy to collaborate with you, uh, uh, can take, on, take this in new, in new directions. OK. The first major contribution I saw was that yours is a political history, a fascinating political history of what happened after incredible expansions in black political empowerment and battles for community control of policing, schools of city budgets in the 1960s and 70s. Too often, our field of race politics has celebrated the expansion of what they call descriptive representation without taking up or even noticing this strategy to dislodge and obstruct and undermine emergent black municipal power and to unleash projects of state oversight, monitoring of local schools, and to dissolve locally elected school boards and to enhance the capacity of state government and shift authority away from race class subjugated communities and towards uh, uh, the state. This was not simply a reaction, Domingo suggests, to educational deficits, to schools not performing well, or a concern even for uh, the outcomes and well-being of black children. It reminds me of something I said in 2007, which was called Front Lash. The explicit strategy to make an end run around pol black political gains by launching a new, uh, a new uh, uh, effort. In other words, takeover. Blacks were in control of schools, you show us. Blacks were the majority of teachers in some of these localities. <coughs> this offered them a unique channel to community action and control over the things that affected their very lives. They had also started to demand more funding from the state government. And yet, they come in with a takeover. The second contribution is takeovers as a fundamentally political phenomenon, a contest over who gets to say, who gets to control the resources of the school, school district, who gets to hire and fire, who gets to appoint the superintendent. You have an argument that I'm persuaded by that black power at the city level is 
what triggers a takeover or makes a takeover much more likely than it otherwise would be. A shocking evidence appears in the in, smack in the middle of the book. I don't know if you how many have read it on page 86. Every single state takeover law passed just after blacks in city in the city <coughs> mounted a successful school litigation campaign went through the courts to demand that they equalize funding across uh, uh, black school districts and white school districts. The only ones that went through that school finance uh, 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 claims in the courts that didn't then endure a state takeover were white, white states. That's a huge finding. That deserves a paper of its own. It suggests what I would call retaliation against black school districts, right? Black school districts say, you're not giving us enough funding, we're unequal, they take them to court, they win, and then they get taken over. That's retaliation. It's retaliatory state governance. I think we need mo way more uh, on that uh, meme. The third contribution um, is that this is not just a book saying, you know, state takeovers are bad and they dislodge and disempower uh, black and brown communities. Takeovers, Domingo reminds us, are not all of a piece. They are not all the same. They are not experienced the same way. Some takeovers, in uh, particularly your Central Falls case, spurred local empowerment, brought people into local governance, brought people, brought Latinos into the school board. Uh, and they, re they, they replaced a kind of old guard uh, of power relations and led to more collaboration and civic participation. They enhanced local democracy. So I like that you are actually finding these heterogeneous effects of, of state takeovers. I also liked your, um, the fact that you're attentive to just the descriptive. You're not just testing hypotheses, but you're actually just giving us a basis for seeing how prevalent takeovers are, right? So I learned, who knew, that state takeovers were imposed in 80% of cases by Republican governors. Okay, I mentioned that the research should have legs, that there's several different interesting di directions you could take it in, um, and I mentioned one particular avenue at the start. Um, I think that takeovers are happening in concert with other actions of state and city uh, governments. <coughs> so, suggest a broader way in which the government orients itself towards race class subjugated communities. The most punitive forms of takeovers, you remind us, were reserved, almost universally reserved, for black districts. What else goes along <coughs> with takeovers, I kept thinking as I read the book. How else are strong local democracy in black cities checked routinely? So in this criminal justice domain, there was a similar move. The conservative legal scholar uh, Bill Stuntz argues that the shift away from local democracy and criminal justice is what doomed criminal justice and led to the, the spurring of the mass incarceration state. Suburbs passed very punitive laws that, have, that affected city residents and that this displacement undermines accountability. You mentioned in, in today's conversation, but also in the book, New Orleans and Flint, of course, right? State emergency uh, takeovers. But I was thinking also about Detroit, where the way the government orients itself, and I use that quite intentionally, towards its residents, was through property tax for foreclosures. Let me say a little bit about this, because most people don't know what this means. Property tax foreclosures. What that city government did, and there's a beautiful, uh, there's a great article by uh, Bernadette Atenhue, uh, who's a law professor, about this, is, is they were in a budget shortfall, and what they did, how did they raise revenue? They went into black communities, and they inflationarily, <coughs> if I can make up a term, raised, raised the evaluation of black residents' homes so if you owned a $120,000 home, the city government said in a year, oh, your house appreciated, uh, it's now a $250,000 house, and your property tax is now this much. So 
Detroit residents who actually were paying their mortgages on time and being fiscally responsible could no longer afford the property tax increases. And so the city comes in and it's called property tax foreclosures. What I want us in this field to do is to piece those different stories together. Because I think there's a broader, if we draw a circle around all the instruments, mm. the Ferguson instruments that we came to know, the Detroit property tax foreclosures, the uh, water emergency in Flint, a picture begins to emerge, right? Mm -hmm. And the picture's not pretty. It's a picture of what Michael called racial paternalism and punitive actions. So I think we need to theorize that a lot better. The second question I kept having is, how do these takeovers, how are they experienced by the citizenry? How do they shape civic capacity of local groups and organizing? I was just thinking of the fatigue that it must take to be fighting for 20 years in Newark to regain control of your schools, and how many other things that you could have been doing and initiatives you could have been pouring your energy into while you were having this battle to just get the right to have control over your schools, right? Um, in several states, you mentioned that over half of black students are attending schools in districts not controlled by their communities, a st staggering number. How does that shape their experiences, right? Schools, you remind us, are a site of civic learning, but you're being educated and governed by an external force. How does that shape your uh, citizenship? I wondered what prevents a takeover? So in your data, what explains the communities that are similar to the Newark case, but that don't endure state interference of this kind and disruption and disenfranchisement uh, to local control? I thought you might explore takeovers of white school districts, even though they don't happen as frequently, and takeovers that almost happened but didn't. So now it wouldn't be, you wouldn't believe my celebration of this book um, uh, unless I offered some critiques. Uh, so I want to offer some things uh, that I thought could be further developed um, uh, just as a way of us having uh, 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 some point of, of contestation. Um, so at times, uh, bad motives are assumed. So I just wondered, was there any merit to this 1,700-page report on Newark's mismanagement of schools. Did parents in the local community support the takeover? Were alternatives offered up and discarded? What happened in the lead up to the takeover? At times in the book, readers need to actually be able to see the debates up close, to hear the arguments and logics, to hear the opposition, to hear the alternatives. In my own city, kids are going to school uh, with no heat in the winter, as you've probably seen from, from the news of the Baltimore schools. <coughs> is it possible that there was merit to this takeover? Is it possible um, that, it's, that it can be both things at once, uh, a, a deliberate strategy to disempower blacks and to remove their political clout, while also actually trying to fix uh, some issues in the city schools? Similarly, why were state takeover laws passed even in those places that never uh, used them? Explore more the political discourse and the hearings. Do interviews with the actors who observed the process up close. Did they see, did, do they agree with your argument that this was a deliberate strategy that, that used educational fixes as a mere justification? Okay, so you show over and you say over and over that this wasn't about fixing education or about you know benefiting black kids, but show us this. Where is the opposition in debates over the passage of these laws? Do more to trace the ideology of community control. Okay, the ideology of community control that's emerging in these places, and the ideology of the conservative education logic that you talk about, that blacks quote I'm quoting your book aren't responsible stewards of their own children's education and well-being. Did those kinds of arguments grow more acute in the lead up to the takeovers? And then finally, the negative effects of takeovers are absolutely uh, staggering and very clear in your book. Disenfranchisement of elected school boards, <coughs> undermining of black leadership, removals and mass firings and displacement. Many of, many of these teachers were replaced with uh, uh, white employees. Funding cuts, a decrease in black representation on the school board, 
governance by distance, a distant elite with no concern or connection to the community. Um, you even mentioned that in the wake of the Newark takeover, the number of school counselors uh, declines. So it's clear that these takeovers um, had uh, uh, very deleterious effects for uh, 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 minority communities. What is less clear from the evidence is that takeovers are a deliberate strategy to shift power uh, and autonomy and authority away from black communities. So you say, quote, school funding and who controlled these resources was a major factor in the decision to take over the school district. Is this also true for communities like Central Falls? To tell your story, I wanted, um, and it's because I believe your results, I wanted a deeper dive uh, uh, into the racial discourse, the explicit racial discourse, the tactics and decisions undergirding the takeovers. Okay, so I don't play, I don't doubt that political threat of black increasing empowerment played an enormous and defining role, but what else was involved? What else was an mediating factor? Do bad educational outcomes and mismanagement play no role? Okay, so I wondered if you could, you know, just highlight, and I actually think that would make your argument even stronger, you know, that highlight that, that you know, school performance and mismanagement was somewhat of a factor, if it was. Um, I felt like sometimes you avoided that to make the threat narrative even starker, but you don't need to do that, right? We, a lot of us <coughs> buy your argument. You show it through the quantitative data. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to end there because I, we have a lot to discuss. It's an incredibly important book. Um, I'll assign it in my classes. I'm uh, thankful for you for sharing it with us and, and for bringing me here. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now the plan is for you to respond, and then we want to have some time left over for the audience to participate. As I look at my watch, I see we have at 5.10, and we're supposed to stop at 5.30. Okay. Am I right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to try to keep us all in. But before you go, but I forgot to do one thing. Uh, see, Domingo has another book that came out just yesterday. Oh, wow. <laughs> Co-edited volume with myself, entitled Latino Mares. And he and I have worked on this book together for the last few years, and uh, I think his copy came home to New Jersey a few days ago, and mine came yesterday. So I said, perfect timing, I'm going to plug our new <laughs> book entitled uh, Latino Mares. So another congratulations to uh, Domingo. And and I know some of you are from Providence, and you might recognize the picture here. This is a picture of Angel Tavares uh, being sworn in as the first Latino mayor of Providence, uh, Rhode Island. Uh, Temple University Press, a paperback and hardback available. Okay. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Domingo, why don't you uh, okay. do something as succinct as you could okay. so we can do, uh, get some of the audience in also, okay? Okay, yes. So thank you so much for the comments. Um, and I'll just quickly, I think two major questions here that I want to address uh, briefly and then we oh, can go to the, to, to the audience. Uh, so Michael, you asked this question about the empowerment by zero sum. So must it be a zero sum? I think that's a really good question. And I think I'm able to show that under certain conditions, you know, it doesn't have to be a zero sum game. So even in Newark, after the takeover, there, was, there, were, there were periods under this 20-year regime, there were periods when you had state government that was aligned with local forces, uh, in, you know, the mayor, the superintendent, the school board, and there, there was the stability that allowed Latinos to increase their representation. African Americans remained, their representation remained level, but there seemed to be this, um, uh, what, you know, what I call a cohesive state local regime where the, 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 the stakeholders were not pushed to the side they were included in the conversation. And so I think that's an example of it not having to be zero sum. So I think, so I think there's opportunities for that there. So I just wanted to, 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 to share that. Um, and uh, Vesla made some really great points. I just want to just the one, the one part about the not, not, not saying enough about perhaps the, the conditions right. 
you know, right. not being right. ideal in, in, in Newark. And maybe that 1,700-page report having some mm-hmm. legitimacy. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that 1,700-page report, which the state of New Jersey uh, uh, produced in order to justify the takeover, they're, they're completely correct, right? So 1,700 pages outlining all of the problems in the school district. What I what, what I tried to, to, to show in the book is that you know this it was it didn't start with the black community right, right? it it was there before mm-hmm. and that the black community in 1967 had a rebellion so Newark along with Detroit you know so every, people know about Detroit because the movie came out had mm-hmm. had a rebellion one of the deadliest uh, mm-hmm. uprisings urban uprisings in the United States and a major reason for that and we know this because of uh, the governor issued a, a, a task force to examine the factors that led to the rebellion was the conditions in the schools in Newark. Number one, that the black community, although they represented the majority of the population and student population, didn't have political empowerment, felt frustrated. But in addition to that, that the conditions in the school were poor, were poor. And so the black community gains political empowerment. I you know, tried to show this in the book. They gained political empowerment. And one of the things that they tried to do was critical to the, political, uh, to the project of political empowerment in Newark was to fight for resources. So at the time that they start to fight for resources and are promised more resources because the, the state courts say that they're demanding more resources, the state produces this report to justify the takeover. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's correct. Mm-hmm. But the blame is it's, it's what, what, what I'm questioning here, right? And so um, perhaps I didn't do as good a job of explaining it, but I hopefully I do a better job in conversations with people explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, um, should we just open it up now to, uh, to questions? There's a microphone? Okay, good. There's All right, so my question is, in a district like Providence where you have substandard buildings, substandard test scores, things like that, do you think there's a reluctance of the state to come in and take over a district because of the size, number of students, or do you think considering that half the city's budget is the school department, there would be more incentive. Like, do you think Providence is close to a takeover? Well, so here's a- another part of the book which we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. So I talk about, again, these uh, cohesive and uh, disjointed state local regimes. Because the city of Providence, in this particular case, uh, you, ha- you ask about Providence, the city of Providence is a majority democratic city. The state government is a majority democratic state government. You are less likely to see the type of hostile intervention that we see in other places like Detroit or even Newark when it happened, in Baltimore when it happened, and so forth. So I don't think that the hostile takeover, the way that, that, you know, that I write about, I don't think is likely to happen in, in, in Providence. But uh, 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 intervention <laughs> is likely to happen. And it may have a different type of face, a different type of feel, but it may have similar effects. So I don't know that a takeover is, is indeed going to happen in, in, in Providence or not, but I do think that the conditions, the political conditions are there, that even if a state intervention were to happen, that the mechanism, so whether the, the teachers' unions, the community groups, and uh, the school board or whatever, that they'll have, they're not going to be pushed to the side because politically it's problematic for the state government. So that's very, very different than what we see happening in Mississippi, that we see happening in Alabama, in New Orleans, and so forth. Very different. Uh, uh, my question, I guess, is like a two-part question. First, the the law that they passed in New Jersey was that one of those like Alec template bills, mm. and then secondly, does the does the design of the the state school board matter if it's elected, appointed, multi-member districts, single-member districts? Does that matter? Uh, because you know, you might have a school board that has single-member districts, but they might have one majority minority member, but that doesn't give them any leeway or any, any voting power on the district. So to, to the Alec uh, piece, so the New Jersey one wasn't, right? So New Jersey, pretty early on, uh, mid-1980s, they start to push for this. And so Alec, by that point, is not doing this. Eventually, Alec does. So like by the time we get to Georgia, mm-hmm. Alec is a major part of it, right? Yeah. So, so that's that. Now to the question about the, the school board type. So does it matter for what? The state school board. Like the state. Oh, th- that's a good question. I don't have an answer to that. Uh, don't, I don't have an I mean, that's a good question. I, I, 
I didn't collect that data and I didn't run any analysis for that, but that's a good question. Um, in your in your work, did you look at all um, at like curriculum changes within those districts? Um, and so, like an example that comes into mind is I think in Arizona there were some students who wanted ethnic studies, and then the state the state came in and said no. Um, or uh, with extracurricular programs like clubs or whatever, um, like in relation to sports, if there's no money, do sports get more money in those districts or whatever? Um, or if teachers are getting cut, are they getting cut from certain um, subjects more than others? Yeah. So uh, uh, that really through my case studies, some of that comes through. So in the case of Central Falls, for example, so by the time, and uh, we were hoping to see uh, Superintendent here, uh, uh, Victor Capellan, and uh, the ch uh, school board chair, Ana Cana Morales, perhaps they're upstairs. But they, Central Falls Takeover School District, they've had complete flexibility to have the type of curriculum that they want, to hire the people that they want. And part of the reason, again, it goes back to this political, what I argue is this, this political alignment that exists between the state and the local. So Anna Cala Morales, school board chair, is about to, she's, and I write about this in the book, she's about to resign from the school board because she has people on the school board who are not willing to go along with what she thinks the community wants to do. And so the, the, the commissioner of education said, no, 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 no. We can't allow you to leave. You're too important for us. So we'll do what you need us to do. And she eventually is able to hire the, uh, 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 recruit the type of people that they want on the school board, which has an effect on the superintendent that they hire. And questions of curriculum are able, they, uh, uh, they're able to incorporate a type of curriculum that is what they think the community needs. And so again, this is an example. And even in Newark, there's, play, there's times when the, the state has uh, and the community has uh, th this relationship with the state, even under state control, where they're able to put curriculum in place that they want, right? But when it first happens, this, this hostile intervention, we see that curriculum, we see that pr uh, particular teachers, we see, as Vetchla mentioned, uh, 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 caseworkers, um, uh, uh, social workers, that they get removed from the picture, that they get fired. And so that has you know, I argue negative implications. So we see some of that in, 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 in the, the book. Before we go to the audience, I have two quick questions. And, and it's sort of uh, P Professor Henning's uh, comments triggered one. Uh, what is the role of the legislature in these takeovers? You focus a lot on governors, which I suspect is appropriate. Um, but I know from doing my work on, on Maryland and Baltimore that it was, you know, key uh, members of the Education Committee, key people who controlled the budget, you know, who, who, you know, forced these kinds of proposals. So one of the things I wondered about is simply what's the role of the legislature and does, I guess it varies depending on, uh, depending on the, uh, on the state. And then the other question I had is what, Another one that uh, Jeff mentioned is, is this running out? Has, have states figured it out that they can't do anything much better than the folk uh, in, in, have they figured out that, you know what, we don't know what the hell we're doing either, you know what I mean? <laughs> have they figured this out? So, the, so Jeff is saying maybe they were recognizing that this is, I can't see a state wanting to take this on. You know, this is not, a, this is not an easy, job to do. So I don't see why a state really would want to take this on unless they have to. Unless they really have to. I don't know. Yeah. So about the role of the state uh, legislature, legislatures, yeah. right? Uh, so yes, they have a critical role to play in this. But both on the kind of the hostile side and on the prevention side, to, to your question. So we see black leg state legislators, for example, from Essex County, where, where Newark is, really fighting mm -hmm to prevent a takeover from happening and under certain conditions before the takeover were successful. And then even after the takeover under Republic, uh, Democratic administrations, really cr helping create the conditions because mm. they're influential uh, state legislators for more of the <coughs> partnership type of role, okay. right? So we see, we see that happening. And to this other question about is it running out? You have they figured that this is really tough and are they yeah, running I mean, away the, from it or are they yeah, still the moving? Jury, the jury's still out. I'll tell you, my... I have more cynical kind of uh, take on this. 
I do think, and that's based on observations from New Orleans. It's based on what I think is uh, happening in Philadelphia and even in, in, in Newark. I think that the state has uh, done enough, including, and, and reformers, which have aligned with the state in many ways, have done enough to kind of lay the groundwork for a type of reform that is favorable to the state, and like charter schools, for example. And so champions of charter schools, they're dominating in New Orleans. They're dominating, we're about to dominate in, in Newark, right? And so that the state feels a lot safer mm -hmm. about that environment now, right? And, and, and I think in some ways that comes at the expense of the community groups, of the black teachers and so forth. So the jury's still out, right? Yeah. And so this is kind of a, a hypothesis in a way because, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't tested it, but I think that might be providing the, the conditions for the state to feel safer about returning local control. Uh, we have a question uh, from upstairs. Anna Kenna Morales is upstairs. <laughs> and she was hoping that you would talk a little bit more about the commissioner's role and how tied to the governor's role. Oh, that's a really good question. And State commissioner. Yeah, the commission. So they play a critical role, important role. So at the time of the takeover in Newark, the first uh, uh, cabinet appointment that uh, Whitman makes, the Republican governor, they uh, under her uh, tenure, the takeover happens in Newark. The first appointment that she makes is commissioner of education, and that commissioner of education made it clear right from the beginning that we're going to take over the Newark school. Right? So commissioner plays a very important role. It played it there, and it played it in, uh, in Rhode Island. And you know, uh, Anna Conner Morales has perhaps an example, a better example than any of us. Again, she's appointed by the state to be um, uh, chair of the, well, to, be, to join the, the school board. Uh, and she's noticing on the school board that you have all of these white guys uh, in Central Falls who are not reflective of their community. And she says, you know, I'm about to leave. And she reaches out to the commissioner, and the commissioner said, no, we can't afford for you to leave. And so they work together. The commissioner's vision to uh, appoint new members, get rid of those members, so that they can advance a certain type of agenda. So that commissioner was critical. And then the last piece I want to say about the commissioner is that even under uh, state control in, in, uh, in New Jersey, when uh, McGreevy becomes a Democrat, becomes governor, and he becomes governor largely as a result of the support that he gets from Sharp James, black mayor from, from Newark. He appoints a commissioner, Commissioner Libera, who said, one of the first things I want to do is return local control to, to Newark. Now, he wasn't able to do it because the state legislature didn't allow him to do it, but what he did was he, provide, he created the conditions, given the parameters, the powers that he had, to have the community have a bigger say. And so commissioners play a very, very important role here. <coughs> we have a time for maybe one, one more. Uh, Doris, yeah. Thank you. Um, it is a pleasure, Domingo, to be here today. Um, so let me go to the community role and the conditions. So in your case studies, did, could you, based on that, could you talk about the conditions that were there for the community to do that uprising that you talked about. Um, sadly, as you know, um, when you correlate the conditions that may be present in Providence, one has to wonder if the community as a whole, including the families and parents, shouldn't be more active in, uh, in demanding uh, an increase in quality of education and conditions. So I'm just wondering if there is something to be learned or something that we can do locally to make sure that the community um, is not only aware, but that there is action taken. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important question. So, you know, as a political scientist, the way that we look at community involvement, the best way to get individuals involved in, in, in uh, politics engaged is through community organizations. It's you know the work that I do, the work that Marion uh, has done, and others. Uh, through community organizations. And so through community organizations, we can, I think, th there are models for a robust 
uh, community presence in the schools, right? And community organizations do that. Newark has a rich tradition of community organizations. Many of these cities have a rich tradition of community organizations. My concern, and this goes back to kind of the setting the, the groundwork for the return of local control, is that community organizations have been pushed to the side when it comes to school uh, matters. Partly because of charter, this, the expansion of charter, of charter movement and so forth, Partly for other reasons, it's just across the board, community organizations are not getting the support that they need, and we see them going away. So, so I think that there's a vital role to play there. The, in terms of community involvement through organizations. The, 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 uh, the last point I want to make about this, and you know, I, I, I kind of finish off the book by talking about this. I say that black political empowerment and Latino political empowerment suffer because there is an absence of black and Latino political empowerment. And so in a case of Newark, in a case like Providence and other places where you have significant African American and Latino communities, and they're fighting for Latino issues or fighting for black issues, that creates a vulnerability that states could exploit. And it's what happened in Newark. The Latino community in Newark in 1994, right before the takeover, they were like, you know, we don't have no political power here. So the state comes in and takes it over. It's not bad for us. The African-American community obviously felt very strongly about this with reason. But at the end of the day, they were all hurt by it. And so it, to me, is a lesson about, so in addition to state-level politics, in addition to city-level politics, that communities have to come together to either invite a state intervention because the state doesn't have to be bad or reject mm -hmm. state intervention collectively. And they could only do that through coming together. The nice thing and the positive thing, and I want to end it like Jeff ended it in a positive note, the positive thing that there is no better place to come together than the schools, that it provides an, an, an opportunity, an avenue that it doesn't have to be zero sum. And all communities can come together because they supposedly care about schools, so it provides the, the, the great opp opportunity to, to have that. But um, regrettably, we don't see enough of it. One of the wonderful underlying aspects of this book that I think is so uh, wonderful, Domingo, is that you're the first scholar that I'm aware of that takes the question of takeover and raise the question of what is its broad impact on the communities? Not only on the schools, but what does it mean in a broad way when, when the entity like the state uh, comes in? And so you, your book opened eyes and raised lots of interesting and fundamental questions about democracy in this country. So I'm so happy to this. Let me say that you guys don't realize, in academia, right. university press is like the gold standard, okay? You, when you publish your book, you're going to publish your book by university press. It's the gold standard in, in academia. And so uh, 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 Domingo's book is published by University Press, and it's published by one of the most outstanding university presses out there. So um, congratulations. We're going to have a book signing. Where is it? Out, right out here. Right outside. Please, everybody, give a round of applause for this wonderful panel. Thank you.